Atheism is dead. Long live the new atheism. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I will be your host as we go on this journey. Just as a reminder up front, please like, subscribe, and download this podcast with impunity. Every chance you get, tell your friends, shout it on the street corners, because we are trying to build and advance this podcast. But more than that, advance the grace and truth that is found in Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. Why do I say provocatively that the new atheism is dead? Well, the new atheism, just a quick word on that, was very hot 20 years ago, helmed by Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and a number of other figures. The new atheism made major waves. Figures like Sam Harris, in addition, basically posed a very serious public square challenge to Christianity and to faith and theism in general. And for a time, it seemed to many of us in the West like the new atheism was here to stay and was going to be a major competitor in the public square. But the new atheism in recent days has lost much of its steam, and it just lost a good burst of that steam in addition when Ion Hersey Ali at the ARC conference in London proclaimed publicly that she was now a Christian. I was at the ARC conference in October 2023 in London. It was a joy to be there. I'm thankful that I had that opportunity, surprised to find myself there in many respects. And when I heard Ali make that pronouncement from the stage, I thought, this is a serious moment in Western intellectual life and Western culture. And this is part of a growing trend among Western intellectuals moving out of atheism and skepticism into some form of Christian faith, some form of an embrace of Christianity. Now, that last phrase, two phrases, is very important because though I'm tracking where Ali is currently, just out of interest and care for her soul and praying for her, and I very much encourage you at the outset to pray for this woman and many others like her who are considering the claims of Christ and in some form embracing it, them, uh, I'm not entirely sure where she is. I, I don't know what church she finds herself in at this time. I believe she lives in California in the Stanford area with her husband, uh, the very accomplished economist Neil Ferguson, but I don't know much about the personal details of her story. I'm guessing some of those may come out more in days to come, but I'm not privy to those. So I don't know exactly where Ali is on her journey, but I can say this as well. I'm reminded uh, in this moment of how the great apologist and writer C.S. Lewis, uh, just about 100 years ago, uh, started thinking through the claims of Christianity. I guess it's a few years shy of 100 years. But roughly in this period, in the 1920s, there was a movement of many intellectuals embracing, in some form, Christian ideas, Christian truth, the Christian worldview. Not all of those intellectuals, I'll mention some of them later, in my judgment, from what I can tell, became a born-again believer, became an evangelical, became a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ through saving faith in his substitutionary cross and his vicarious resurrection for sinners like us. In other words, I'm not in this game for people to become, in vague terms, a Christian or simply to embrace Christian ideas. I'm in this for the gospel. That's what I care about. The gospel, Romans 1.16, is the power of God unto salvation. And so that's the very center, the burning center of my humble project, such as it is. With that stated very clearly, however, I am very much interested in the trend of intellectuals taking stock of Christian truth claims in the Christian worldview, even in a general sense, even if they don't cross the line into saving faith, which is, of course, what we pray for and most desire. And I do think that there is a broader cultural significance to this trend uh, that we need to study and take note of as well. Furthermore, a lot of us have an apologetic interest and an apologetic bent even. I certainly do as a presuppositionalist apologetic, apologetics practitioner. Uh, though I can't seem to say it in public here. And so even if you are not uh, a presuppositionalist, many of you out there are going to have interest in apologetics. And I think this is a, a moment when something is happening. God is shaking the firmament of the intellectual West. 
And uh, there's a lot that's happening in response to that. And so wherever you precisely find yourself on the Christian spectrum, on the evangelical spectrum, this is a moment to sit up and pay attention and recognize that even as there is much darkness afoot and terrible things happening all around us, nonetheless, there are also surprising and fascinating developments in America and the West as well. And there may indeed be more like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who come to some form of Christian commitment in the days ahead. And we want to have our baskets in hand in a John 4, 35 sense, knowing that the harvest is white. And uh, it's time for us right now to make every disciple that we can in love and in grace, seeking to spread mercy to sinners just like us. So this isn't about our team versus their team. Um, it's not about the stupid new, new atheist now losing in the public square or something like that. That's not the burden of my heart or this podcast. What we want to do is take stock of what's happening in our world. This is very significant. Ali just wrote an unheard piece uh, entitled, Why I Am Now a Christian, Atheism Can't Equip Us for Civilizational War. So we want to track in this episode uh, why Ali is saying, wh what she is telling us about her switching over to the Christian side. And it's very significant that the title itself, and she may not have written this title, of course, talks about the functional power of Christianity. That's from the outset what she is focusing on. Atheism subtitle can't equip us for civilizational war. And as we're going to talk about in today's episode, that's significant. Um, she's going to bring out the civilizational conflict that she sees all around her, and she's going to make the claim, make the argument, I think she's right, that um, we are in a precarious time and there are not many civilizational resources at hand, and the vaunted leftist tradition is not offering uh, the West answers in the face of rising militarism, uh, in the face of wokeness, in the face of numerous challenges of a pagan kind. In fact, the left is actively promoting many of those ideas and thus destroying the very house in which we live. It's the strangest thing before I dive into her article uh, momentarily to live in the West because the West in many sense is a house in which uh, two siblings live. One of the siblings, in a general sense, is thankful to live in the house and wants the betterment of the house, so to speak. Uh, and the other sibling wants to destroy the house, even as the said sibling enjoys all the comforts of living in that house. The first sibling is not to be neatly identified only with evangelicals. It's a broad coalition of what you could call traditionalists in some sense. The second side is definitely those who would align with the political left and the intellectual left beyond the, politic, the political uh, realm. And so we uh, find ourselves trying to convince our sibling who lives in the same house we do and has all the same benefits we do that this is actually a good house to live in and let's put the matches down and let's step away from the gas tank and why don't we not blow up the house? But that's where we find ourselves. We are in a world where things often, not just occasionally, do not make sense. It does not make sense to burn down the house in which you live. It is fine to critique failings of the past, of course, in the West and elsewhere, but it does not make sense to try to destroy the very civilization in which you live, and yet that is what is occurring uh, today in 2023. And that is what has been occurring in the West for really decades and even hundreds of years in different forms and to do different degrees, depending on where you find yourself. So here we are. As Christians, I actually believe that we are supposed to seek the good of the city in which we live in a Jeremiah 29, 7 sense, because as we're seeking the shalom of the place in which we live, uh, even in Babylonian exile, in the context of that passage, which very much applies to us today, as we talked about in prior episodes on the podcast, so we are going to find our shalom. So we're not supposed to, as Christians, uh, hate our surroundings, hate our neighbor, and we're not supposed to depart from our surroundings and leave our neighbor behind. We're called into this much, much more difficult and taxing and glorious calling of actually being where God would have us be and striving to be salt and light in that place in a Matthew 5 sense. And this includes striving to be 
a gospel-driven witness unto Jesus Christ to fellow sinners. And all that builds into trying to understand the argument that Ali is making. Before I dive into her article, let me just say that Ayan Hersey Ali is a research fellow at Stanford at the Hoover Institution. There, uh, she has founded a foundation in her name. She hosts a very popular podcast. She's written a new book called Pray, colon, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. And though I'm, I'm guessing I wouldn't agree with everything in that book, I would encourage you to read it, I'm sure. Uh, there is truth in a common grace sense to be found in it because Islam is not, as we're going to see, uh, pro-woman in any sense. It is a shocking reality today to see many young women in these cities across the world uh, stumping for Hamas, for example, in one march after another because there is not a worldview that is less pro-woman than militant Islam of the Hamasian kind. So again, uh, destroying the house in which you live, and actively, we can go further, inviting those outside who are throwing Molotov cocktails at the house in which you live to come inside and throw them in there. Not a good look. Here's what Ali says then at the foundation, at the beginning of this article, why I am now a Christian for the website Unheard, an important website you should check out. In 2002, she writes, I discovered a 1927 lecture by Bertrand Russell entitled, why I am not a Christian. It did not cross my mind as I read it that one day, nearly a century after he delivered it to the South London branch of the National Secular Society, I would be compelled to write an essay with exactly, or precisely is her word, the opposite title. So this is the framing. Ali, uh, years ago, about 21 years ago, uh, warmed to Bertrand Russell. She goes on to say why she found comfort in Bertrand Russell's atheist credo. When I read Russell's lecture, I found my cognitive dissonance easing. It was a relief to, an, to adopt an attitude of skepticism towards religious doctrine, discard my faith in God, and declare that no such entity existed. Best of all, I could reject the existence of hell and the danger of everlasting punishment. Russell's assertion that religion is based primarily on fear resonated with me. I had lived for too long in terror of all the gruesome punishments that awaited me as a Muslim. While I had abandoned all the rational reasons for believing in God, that irrational fear of hellfire still lingered. Russell's conclusion thus came as something of a relief. When I die, I shall rot. Okay, so here we're finding something very important in Ali's journey, we're finding that it was primarily um, fear-based religion that had turned her away from Islam. She does talk here about hellfire, and we're not certain what she believes today in 2023 in that respect. Of course, we as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, have to believe in hell and know that God is perfectly just. And so hell for us is not something we're trying to escape from as a biblical reality. Hell causes all of us, rightly, uh, to recoil in terms of the reality of, of punishment for loved ones, for example. But we know that whatever God does is just. And so we're not building and framing out our Christianity based on what we like or don't like in terms of doctrine or biblical teaching. No Christian should ever do that. That is a terrible instinct that has been taught to you by a culture of deconstruction and doubt of Scripture, but that is not a sound instinct. There are hard parts of the Scripture, and this is part of what we say apologetically as Christians. There are hard doctrines. We're not here to present everything in Christian faith and in Scripture as if it is going to be equally palatable uh, to the hearer. There are some things that are really going to sound wonderful, like total forgiveness of sin, pro probably for many, but then there are other parts that are going to be very challenging to swallow, like the reality of eternal punishment for sin. Uh, that's not popular with many people. Uh, we ourselves can't pick and choose the parts of Christianity we like. It's, it's either all or nothing as a Christian system, but it is very significant uh, to note that what turned Ali atheist was really not a, a really long, complex argument. It was the idea that you didn't have to live under the specter of fear. 
uh, that had been fomented by Islam. She goes on to talk about how Islam preached basically a religion of fear and very little pleasure. And again, this is very important to track. You don't often get a very, very thoughtful person working through their spiritual journey. This is of value to us. She writes this. The alternative, indulging in the pleasures of the world, was to earn Allah's wrath and be condemned to an eternal life in hellfire. Some of the worldly pleasures that Muslim preachers were decrying included reading novels, listening to music, dancing, and going to the cinema, all of which I was ashamed to admit that I adored. Let me pause here again. This is so important for us as Christians to pause on because many people around us view evangelical Christianity in much the same terms. Sometimes people wrongly caricature uh, biblical Christianity as being anti-pleasure. Uh, biblical Christianity, just so I put this on record, is not at all anti-pleasure. In Psalm 1611, for example, we learn that the, the pleasures of God are forevermore. They're before us. They're going to be uh, ours in all eternity at your right hand, the psalmist says, are pleasures forevermore, to get that technically precise. So Christianity, as John Piper and others have rightly written about Jonathan Edwards most significantly in all the Christian theological tradition reflecting on Scripture, have covered that and have rightly grasped that true Christianity is the way of joy. It's not the way where pleasure goes to die. It's actually the way where all those small pleasures make sense because of the greater pleasure that is knowing Jesus Christ and being known by him through his saving grace. Now, there are, of course, many things that we do avoid as Christians. There's art that we don't consume. There's shows we don't watch. There's movies we don't go to and so on and so forth. Uh, our, our pleasure is always to be a morally driven pleasure. So let's say that. But fundamentally, we have to say this as well uh, in response to what Ali is saying and applying it to the evangelical grid. We are sometimes anti-pleasure. Christianity can end up a kind of miserable faith in a not altogether dissimilar sense to that which Ali is describing of Islam. I'm not saying Christianity and Islam are the same or something like that, but it is possible for your presentation of Christianity to be warped and for you to think that Christianity is a joyless following of rules and a tight rigidity and severity under a God who was basically angry all the time, even at his blood-bought people. And that is very important for us to say because a lot of people out there have a wrong doctrine of God. I'm going to be talking about this in our next episode. I'm doing kind of companion episodes. In this one today, I'm talking about Ali's journey into some embrace of Christian ideas. In the next episode, I'm talking about how uh, Christian faith, true Christian faith, is not driven by a wrong fear. So I'm going to talk more about that to come. But let me just say very quickly here that a fair number of people in various denominations and according to various backgrounds, have not heard a balanced, robust, and rightly biblical doctrine of God. Their God is severe, even coming from a Christian standpoint. In fact, even if the gospel is preached in a church, there still can be a wrong focus on God as basically angry all the time, and that can filter into the life of the church in the form of angry men in particular, angry fathers, and angry mothers as well, and that creates a whole lot of rattled and scalded children who are not justified in rejecting the Christian faith, don't misunderstand, but do experience wrong doctrine, and that wrong doctrine does have real and tragic effects. So we want to take note of this, even if we're not within a country mile of being a Muslim, we want to know and remember and not quickly uh, jump away from the reality that a lot of people out there are sold a religion of fear. Fear controls people pretty easily. Uh, it's not ultimately a good strategy uh, for influencing people, make no mistake, 
But for a short or midterm program, fear is a pretty good way to get people to do what you want. But that's the problem with a fear-based approach. It really is just manipulation and control, attempted control at the end of the day. But true Christian faith is not about manipulating people or getting them merely to do what we want them to do. True Christian faith is about bringing people to the living God and enabling them to experience his mercy and his grace and his love and his kindness. So we've got to make sure that we've got the right calibration for the Christianity that we ourselves are promoting. In the present day, Ali clearly fears for the future of the world. This is what she says explicitly as we go on in her unheard essay. Part of the answer for why she's embracing Christianity is global. Western civilization is under threat from three different but related forces. The resurgence of great power authoritarianism and expansionism in the forms of the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir Putin's Russia, the rise of global Islamism, which threatens to mobilize a vast population against the West, and the viral spread of woke, the, uh, woke ideology, excuse me, which is eating into the moral fiber of the new generation. So, in response to these real threats, what some have called the strong gods, the strong gods are back, as Reno has said, Ali understands the goods of Christianity in functional terms, not exclusively, but she has a real focus on the functional power and importance of Christianity in this essay. Here's what she says. To me, this freedom of conscience and speech is perhaps the greatest benefit of Western civilization. It does not come naturally to man. It is the product of centuries of debate within Jewish and Christian communities. It was these debates that advanced science and reason, diminished cruelty, suppressed superstitions, and built institutions to order and protect life while guaranteeing freedom to as many people as possible. So this is important. In this essay, Ali is focusing primarily on, as I say, the functional effect of Christianity. Now, I, I want to be very clear in my own personal confession. I agree that um, Christianity has had a wonderful civilizing effect in the West. And uh, like many others, I would much rather live in a society that is strongly influenced by Christianity than one that is strongly influenced by Islam. This is not me saying that, therefore, we should embrace Christian nationalism. As listeners and viewers of this podcast will know, we are not faced with a reductionistic choice between either all the bad stuff or Christian nationalism. So let that be said. In fact, actually, what um, Christianity has influenced the world and, and influenced the West to embrace our realities like, ideals like, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, religious liberty. Those are concepts, uh, I believe, that are firmly grounded in the Christian tradition beyond that in the Word of God itself. That's a subject for another day. My point is to affirm that Ali is right in terms of the effect of different Christian ideals and biblical truths on civilizations of the West. Christianity does have functional power. Christianity is of tremendous good and benefit to societies, to individuals. Christianity is grounded in honoring the dignity of the individual person. I don't mean atomistic individuality. I don't mean expressive individuality. I don't mean enlightenment individuality. Christian individualism is often conflated with enlightenment individualism. The individual per Locke, John Locke, being a tabula rasa, being a blank slate of ideas. And in the modern sense, that idea is taken in the form of you create your own identity, you express whoever you most wish to be, most are per your desires. Christian individualism is often conflated with that kind of enlightenment thinking. Nothing could be further from the truth, though Locke himself uh, has a kind of Protestant outlook on the world and gets some things right, even importantly right in terms of societal formation. Christian individualism is not grounded in a kind of unchained uh, vision of the individual and of the self. The self is not creator. The self is a creature. But that creature 
the human person, the man or the woman, the boy or the girl, is made in the image of God and so definitely does have dignity, worth, and value. Every person, even while a sinner, even deserving of eternal judgment, still has God-given uh, dignity, worth, and value. People are not worthless. People have value as those made by God in God's image, and that's what we are doing in gospel witness, we are calling people to recognize that when you look at the barcode uh, on your elbow, uh, that has uh, the creator's stamp on it. That's the creator's. God made you. Um, you have God's seal upon you. Every person does. And so we are not fundamentally uh, atheistic beings. We are fundamentally theistic beings in the sense that we are made by God. And even in our conscience, Romans 2, we know there's a creator. We know we should obey the creator, Romans 1 as well, uh, even though we do not do that by nature. Ali is warming to the light of Christianity, not just for its functional power. She writes this in her unheard uh, essay. I would, be, I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace of Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I have also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question. What is the meaning and purpose of life? Now that is very important for our purposes. This is the cry, not merely of this woman, this very gifted woman, Ayan Hersey Ali. I believe this is the cry of many people today because many people today were sold a vision of life in which spiritual solace, as she calls it, we'll use her term for now, uh, was not necessary. Nothing could be further from the truth. You can live for a season off of the fumes of success. You can do the hedonistic thing uh, if, if you want for a time. I don't, I'm not encouraging that. I'm saying you can try it. You, you, can, you can test out the idea that hedonism is going to give your life everything you're seeking. Uh, you can try to be a powerful person. You can try to be famous. You can try to get money. All the familiar outlets uh, that people are going to know, they're before you. They're before humanity. And we have been told in the modern West that religion is a thing of the past, that God is dead, that we don't need uh, Christianity, that we don't need the Bible, that we don't need divine grace. But in different forms, in God's providence, in God's working, people are discovering that that is absolutely not the case. We have a soul. We need solace. We need help. We've never felt more alone in terms of our culture and our society than people do today. Look at how we spend uh, much of our days in the West in terms of what prosperity has yielded us. We look down at these little devices in our hands by the hour, hour after hour after hour. We're supposedly on social media, and yet we're alone on social media. That's just one instantiation of this modern reality. People are depressed. People are discouraged. Hard things happen to everybody, N not just the common person like me and you. Terrible things happen to the high and mighty, to the rich and famous. Terrible things happen that shake you, that destabilize you, that cause you to realize that uh, just chasing after whatever you're chasing in terms of success or money or sex or, or fame or power, whatever it may be, that does not answer the deeper needs of the human person. You can succeed. You can write books. You can get famous. You can be on the speaking circuit. You can have a beautiful spouse, whatever it may be. All that can be enjoyable in its own right, but you don't have anything deep in your soul to withstand not the good stuff, but the really hard stuff. You don't have, to use Ali's term, spiritual solace. And I would say as a theologian, and just as a Christian, even beyond that, people like this, even very successful people, even people saying some good things in common grace terms, Ali has uh, fostered a stinging uh, critique of Islam over the years, for example, and rightly so, but they, they don't have Christ. 
it's not just that they're missing theism. <laughs> it's not that they're missing religion or they need a little more spirituality in their life. Friends, that's the way these conversations have been framed and will be framed. It's that every single person out there has an inexhaustible need for the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. I'm not on brand here. I'm going to scripture. John 1.17 is real. It's speaking truth. And it's telling us that every person needs equally the grace and truth that is found in Jesus Christ. Our greatest need is not self-fulfillment. Our greatest need is not self-esteem. Our greatest need is not affirmation from our peers. Our greatest need is not money or fame or power or sex. Our greatest need is the total forgiveness of our sin. That's where everyone stands. People may accept that idea at some level, or they may reject it altogether out of hand. Every single person desperately needs the grace that is found in Christ. Every single person desperately needs the mercy that is found in Christ. And the human heart will cry out for that grace and mercy until it is found. Sadly, many people will not find it. But I pray, as we conclude for today, I pray that Ion Hersey Ali will find the grace and truth that is in Jesus Christ. She may have. She may, on the other hand, have, in a kind of C.S. Lewis-like way, um, become a theist. It, it sounds to me, I don't know, ultimately, but it sounds to me in my quick read and tracking of where she seems to be that she is a theist now. And that's not necessarily a terrible thing. That's something you know I read and I'm thankful uh, to read about. But that can't be the end of the journey in terms of the rescue and redemption of the human person. It's not enough, in other words, to become a theist. It's not enough to become a, a generic Christian. It's not enough to want to defend and strengthen Western civilization. That's not bad in itself. That's good. But fundamentally, what the human person most needs is Jesus Christ. That's where all the questing comes to an end. When you have Christ, that's where you find lasting rest. He is where you find peace. It is in Christ and Christ alone that you find shalom, everything that is good and nothing that is bad. And that is what she needs. And that is what every person around us needs. We're no better than her and we're no worse than her. Every person needs shalom, but there is only one place to go to find it. It is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So there's wonderful news out there. A hundred years ago, T.S. Eliot, Evelyn Waugh, C.S. Lewis, all these Western intellectuals were in some sense grappling with Christian claims and the Christian worldview. Something similar to that moment is happening in our time right now. Uh, a good number of Western leaders and intellectuals are leaving behind atheism and skepticism. It has not worked well for them, frankly. And yes, the new atheism is dead. Its day is over. It did not make good on its claims. You cannot cash that check. You can't be an atheist and find what your soul needs. You can get an approximation for a time of what you want and what you desire and maybe even what you need, but you will only fill a thimble full in terms of what your soul truly requires. Ali has crossed the line into theistic uh, conviction at some level. Here is my prayer as we conclude, that she is one of a rising tide of really gifted men and women out there, people who bear God's image, people we as born again Christians should love and reach out to as sinners just like us. People we look at and we and we see tremendous gifting in and we say, wow, <laughs> you haven't done this for yourself. God has given you so many gifts. You have such dignity. You have such potential. There's so much you could do for Jesus Christ, but you are indeed a sinner and you must humble yourself to the dust itself. And you must reject your sin and repent of your sin before a holy God and know that you are under certain threat of eternal judgment. But here is the good news. It's not just what you're running from. What looms much, 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 much larger 
in the biblical story is what you are running toward. Leave behind the darkness. Leave the city of man. Run toward the city of God. Embrace the grace and mercy that is found in Jesus Christ. There is spiritual solace. It's not found in an it. It's found in a he. It's found in Christ and in Christ alone. God bless you.